great news from Sprint. The wait is finally over. The new Samsung Galaxy Note 10 with the powerful S Pen has arrived at Sprint, and you can get it for 50% off with a Sprint Flex lease. That's right. Get the power of performance and productivity of the Galaxy Note 10 for less than $20 per month. There's never been a better time to switch. To learn more, visit your local Sprint store, sprint.com slash Galaxy Note 10, or call 800 Sprint 1 today. 1979 a month after 1980 monthly credit applied link to bills with approved credit 18 month lease and new line of service. If cancel, literally remain balance due. Excuse tax coverage and offer not available everywhere through the occupation fee restrictions apply. Geico presents Yikes! Another voicemail from your roommate. Sup, roomie? Hey, a pipe burst in the basement. It's completely flooded. Anyway, I called for someone to fix it, but in the meantime, I was thinking we could finally have that indoor pool party we've always wanted. I got some cool swan floaty things already going. Could you pick up some chips on your way home? Later. The Geico Insurance Agency could help keep your personal property protected. Like if your roommate isn't the brightest pool float in the flooded basement. Visit Geico.com to see how easy it is to switch and save on renter's insurance. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 343. A goal without a timeline is just a dream. Robert Herjavec. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Music Bed. As filmmakers, we're always looking for songs and music for our projects, but it's such a pain in the butt to license and go get music, and it's just been a nightmare. But Musicbed has changed all of that. You can download a single song, get unlimited music with a subscription, or even create a custom song or score from scratch. They already have over 20,000 songs beautifully categorized, and their catalog is growing every single day. If you want to check it out, just go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Musicbed. And because you are Indie Film Hustle Tribe members, you get one month for free to try it out or 20% off a single song purchase. Just enter the promo code Indie Film Hustle. Today's show is also sponsored by Blackmagic's new Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. I am super, super jazzed about this camera. It is a Super 35 sensor and has 13 stops of dynamic range, an EF lens mount, and dual native ISO up to 25,600 for incredible low light performance. It features Blackmagic RAW, a large 5 inch touchscreen built-in CFast and SD card readers, and USB-C expansion port to record directly to an external disc. This is an insane camera, guys, and it is a game changer. Oh, and by the way, you also get a copy of DaVinci Resolve Studio to edit, color, do sound for all of your films. If you're going to make a low-budget independent film, this camera is the one for you. It's the one I highly, highly recommend. The camera is running at a ridiculous $24.95. That's it. For more information, please head over to Blackmagic's website at www.blackmagicdesign.com. Now today, guys, I want you to strap on and buckle up because uh, it's going to be a doozy. I am pissed off, and I don't often do episodes like this, but uh, this is going to be a raw episode, so I need you to prepare yourselves for this episode. The last time I did an episode like this was episode 88 or it was called why are F- why are filmmakers so effing broke all the time and what they can do to fix it and if any of you have heard that episode which I'll leave in the show notes a link to it it's me for an hour going off about <laughs> what I was just really upset about and really hoped it helped a lot and it is it's one of the most popular episodes I've ever done on the show but today I'm going to talk about the dark underbelly of film distribution And that also includes self-distribution as well. Now, I've been getting a ton of messages, emails, calls, consulting sessions, coaching sessions about distribution lately. And what I'm hearing is just mind-boggling. So I have to, I just got to put this out there because it's something that absolutely must be discussed and I really need to warn you all about what you might be getting into because a lot of you who listen to me right now have not maybe haven't gone back and listened to the other 342 episodes that I've put out 
And a lot of, within that world of content, there's some of this information, but I'm going to distill it down for this, this episode in regards to film distribution. The legacy model of traditional film distribution is completely stacked against the filmmaker. Understand that when you're walking in. If you're going to make a deal with a traditional distributor, you need to be very, very careful. Now, am I saying all film distributors are evil and blood-sucking and bottom dwellers? No, not all. I'm going to actually give you a, a couple of resources at the end of this episode, which are good distributors and what to look for in a good distribution contract for independent film. But with that said, is the majority of the film distributors that I have been either in contact with or filmmakers that I've worked with, known, or heard of have been con in contact with, have they been bloodsuckers and people who are just plain, some of them are just plain evil? Uh, yes, a lot of them have been. And it is built on this model, this legacy BS model that was started back in the olden days of Hollywood where filmmakers could only go through a distributor to make money. And that is, in today's world, not true. It's not true. Depending on your budget and what you're trying to do, there are options without question. But this legacy model is literally stacked against you. It's like playing craps at a casino. You might win once or twice, but you're always the house is always going to win, and the distributors are the house. And we are the poor gamblers praying that when we put our film on red or our chip or our money on red and we spin that wheel, that it's going to come up in our favor. And it doesn't. More often than not, it doesn't. So this legacy model is a model that preys on the 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 filmmaker who doesn't understand doesn't know isn't educated about or has not reached out to professionals or someone to consult them in regards to their deal now i have a friend of mine who calls me up called me up he has a great movie out uh, and he's trying to look for distribution for it and he's being contacted by all these distributors and uh, I'm not going to name this distributor, but uh, you, if I named them, you would know who it is. Now, this distributor offered this micro-budget independent film, which, by the way, has done very well. He's self-distributed. He's done a bunch of stuff outside of distribution, more like in four-walling and theatrical and things. And he's done very well with it. But now he's looking for a traditional distributor to get it out there. And... They offered him a 15-year deal with a $100,000 expense cap. May I repeat? 15 years and a $100,000 expense cap. Now, let me explain that for everybody who doesn't understand what I just said. The 15-year deal means that this company will own the rights to that film for 15 years okay and that hundred thousand dollar cap is what they are expected to or limit themselves to in its case of expenses for marketing going to film markets trailers posters uh, advertising print everything they're going to limit themselves to a hundred thousand dollars for this film understand something that well first of all that there's a limit is a shock because a lot of these these blood-sucking distributors won't will purposely not put that in the agreement. We'll say, hey, uh, just, you know, we're going to have some expenses. And people who don't know any better will sign it. And the second they sign it, it's done. Because that film will never, ever see any money come in for the filmmaker. That I can promise you. If you sign an agreement like that, you will never see a dime. And even if you sign a deal with a expense cap in there, whether it's 20, 30, 40, 50, $100,000 cap, I promise you that most distributors will bump up to the top of that cap. They will spend every single piece of that cap 
before you ever see a dime. And, and how do they do this? I'll tell you how they do this. Let's say you're going to use, uh, you're going to use them to encode your movie for the online platforms. All right. So let's say you use them and they're going to charge you and then uh, they're going to uh, spend $1,500 by calling a post-production company to encode it for them. They will turn around and charge you $3,000 for it, even though they paid $1,500. So they're already making money off of you before they've even sold anything. And that's just off of encoding. Let's not get into closed captioning, QC reports, every little line item, they will mark up. They will mark them up so they get paid. Do you understand when a film, when a a distributor takes on your film, it's because they believe that they can make some money from it somewhere. That might, might not be necessarily that they're going to actually distribute your film or get it out there in a lot of way, you know, in, in a big, big way. They'll go, look, you know what? We'll be able to make five, ten thousand dollars off this film. Our our expense cap on this film is twenty thousand dollars, and we're going to charge them blah 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 blah. They'll never see a dime, and we'll own it, and it'll it'll, it'll fill out our portfolio and our catalog for the next ten years. And anytime somebody wants to come in and and buy a whole bunch of uh, content, our catalog looks big. Film distributors love having big catalogs because the bigger the catalog they have, the bigger deals they can make with other other distribution or other outlets. So it makes them look a lot bigger than they are. But also don't, don't think that just because they're making big deals that you're going to get any of that money. You know, there's there, there was a story I heard about, a, about a, a filmmaker talking to a distributor the other day. And they said, you know, they were complaining about their reports not getting, you know, not getting reports on a timely fashion and in not being, you know, the communication falling down. And, and this film had been with this distributor for a few years. And the distributor, once they got him on the phone, they said, you know what, man, you're lucky you even got a check. A lot of people don't even get checks. You guys have no idea how good you have it. Can you believe the audacity he said, point blank, you're lucky you even got checks. Most distributors wouldn't even send out checks. Can you, I mean, can you, do you understand how ridiculous this is? But that says everything about this industry, about film distributors, these legacy film distributors, traditional film distributors. This is a systemic problem that has been going on for decades for decades. They feel that they have all the power and then they just think that, you know, filmmakers are just filmmakers. Now, again, not all of them are like this, but a majority of them are. And I would argue with anybody on any panel, anywhere, that I just have not run into a lot of good ones. Are there? Yes, there are. There are some good ones out there. No question. But this is a systemic problem. Now, I was talking to another filmmaker the other day, and they sent over their reporting, their first reporting for a film that this big distribution company, and who will remain nameless, but if you know, if I said their name, you would know who they are. And this distribution company sent them this report. And if you start at the beginning, you're like, okay, you made uh, $20,000 here, uh, you made $15,000 there. Boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden, you're just like, oh, wow, gross take in was like around $55,000, which is great. Holy cow, that's amazing. But as you keep going down, by the time you were at the end of this report, they were in the hole for $30,000. They had made sixty. dollars But because of all the expenses and all the BS and all the chargebacks and all the things that they just throw up on you, that poor filmmaker and that film was in the hole for 30 grand. And the sick part about it is that this is business as usual. This is not an outlier. This is not an exception to the rule. This is the rule for the most part. How does this make any business sense? Just because it's the way people have been doing business for the last 50 years doesn't mean it's right. We are in a different world today, guys. Sure, traditional distributors have a place in it without question. 
the good film distributors definitely have a place in it because hopefully they're there to not only make money for themselves, but help the filmmaker actually make money as well. But this, this, this just arrogance of the way they do business is, is just, it's appalling and it's disgusting. And I'm tired of it. I am absolutely tired of it. I was talking to, uh, at AFM, I was at AFM a few years ago, and I was talking to a, a film distribution executive, and this is what they basically told me. They said that the distributor will give out these ridiculous offers to as many of these films as they feel that they can make any sort of money with. And because they already have a lot of output deals and a lot of relationships because they're a big distributor, they can kind of estimate on how much money they're going to bring in off of any specific title, give or take. Now, if you think that a film distributor is going to actually start pumping money into marketing, that is as rare as a unicorn, which means almost non-existent. <laughs> and basically what happens is this. The distributor will try to see what happens when they put the film out. If they see any sort of heat on it where they can actually generate a little bit more revenue, they'll put a little bit more punch behind it. But generally speaking, they won't. Now, if it's a high-profile film with a high-profile star or something else that they can use as kind of an example of their distributing prowess when they have a, an Oscar-winning actor or actress or a big-time action movie that they've been able to coerce into their mitts, then they will put a lot of money and marketing behind it because that will also help sell other filmmakers to give them their movies because it's a, just a marketing ploy for other filmmakers to go, well, if they're, they're distributing a movie with X, you know, X actor in it who won an Oscar – and this other one that's this is like it looks like a hundred million dollar movie, and they want my little movie. Oh, I must give it to them. I don't care what the deal is. It's part of the game, guys. Understand that. So the executive continues to tell me that out of ten or twenty of those, one of those they'll probably put a little energy into, if that. And the rest of them will they'll just throw up on all the platforms. And if they get no bites, and if they get no uh, no action anywhere else other than on the digital platforms, which anybody can put every, everything up on digital platforms, then it dies. It dies. They won't do a thing because they've got another crop of brand new films coming in next month. And that's the way the cycle goes. If you can't make money for them, don't expect them to get them on the phone. Don't expect an email back. Don't expect quarterly reports, generally speaking. It's just not the way the business is run. It is horrible. It's disgusting. And I'm, I'm just honestly tired of it. So that's why I'm doing this episode. I want to really just put it all out there and hopefully, just hopefully, this episode will help and save a few filmmakers out there. Now, I'm just going to give you a few tips or things that to look out for when signing a deal with a distributor. One, Make sure you have some sort of say over the creative because they will change your movie poster to benefit themselves and to help sell the movie, regardless of what you want. They will re-edit the movie so a drama will all of a sudden turn into a romantic comedy. And then when you watch it, someone shoots somebody else in the head and you're like, what the hell just happened? I thought this was a romantic comedy. That's what I signed up for. So be careful with all of that and make sure you have some sort of say. Also, stay away from long-term contracts. This 15 years is just predatory. It's leech. You're, they're leeches. 10 years is a long time. Now, if someone gives you $100,000, $200,000, dollars up front as a minimum guarantee or an MG, well, that's a different conversation. All of a sudden, then you're like, you know what? You're giving me that much money up front and you might need 10 years to recoup that money, that's a, that's a big maybe. I would estimate anywhere between five to seven years. That was five and seven year deals. Five-year five deals are, are harder to come by, but between five and seven is industry standard. But even then, guys, even then, I want you to understand something very, very clearly. When you sign a five to seven year deal, they own your movie 
for five to seven years or 10 years or 15 years. It's out of your hands. You have no control of any revenue coming in from the sale, rentals, or any exploitation of that film in the distribution world. Think of it as a non-tax deductible donation to them. Because that's what it is. You're just giving your movie away to them for that long. So if you are going to sign a deal this long, you better really do your homework and really feel like this company is going to do something good for you. Because a lot of them will be really upfront. They're very nice. They're very slick. I can make this much money. I'm going to go to AFM. I'm going to go to Cannes. I've got a buyer over in Germany. I'm going to say, oh, I know I can get you on Netflix tomorrow. I could call them directly. All, all of this stuff. I can get you a cable deal. I can get you, I can, I can even sell you on DVDs because I, I know the main buyer at Walmart and at Target. All of this stuff. They'll tell you everything you want to hear. Kind of like a used car salesman. But at least when you buy a lemon, you get to drive off the, the lot with the lemon. You don't just give them your, your car and hope that they're going to do something with it. And that's what this is. Do you, I, 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 this, this whole concept of just making a movie and giving it over to somebody else, giving your power over to somebody else is mind-boggling to me. Do you think that Apple or let's say you create the iPhone. It was, it's, it's the equivalent of me creating an iPhone, spending hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars developing a product like the iPhone. And I don't have a distribution outlet for it, so I go to Apple or I go to another big company and I go, here, here's my, here's my invention, here's my product. I need you to market it and sell it and just give me a kickback and, and, and give me a percentage of the deal. And I'm gonna trust that you're gonna be able to do that. In what other business in the world do you do that? Maybe the music industry? Oh, and definitely the, the publishing business. And those are two other conversations for two other podcasts. But this is like that. It's insane. It is insane. But unlike the music and the publishing business, the end product doesn't cost you millions of dollars in two or three years of your life, generally speaking. So it's, it's insane. It's disgusting. And I, I am making it my goal to put an end to it. Now, a lot of people will also say, well, Alex, I'll just self-distribute it. I'll go through an aggregator. And I, I want to talk about aggregators right now really quickly. You know, if you're going to self-distribute your film, which I did in the past, and you're going to work with an aggregator, and there's a handful of them out there, you have to be careful in one sense. If you've got a $500,000 movie and you're going to try to self-distribute it yourself, you really, really, really need to know what you're doing. You really need to understand marketing. You really need to understand uh, your, your market, your audience, your niche, and have like ninja skills to be able to recoup that kind of money. I mean ninja skills to recoup that money. In all the days that I've been working with Indie Film Hustle and doing research and checking out case studies and all of this stuff in regards to self-distribution success stories, less than a, a half of percent of a percent generate over $500,000. It's they're, they're anomalies. That's not the norm. So you need to understand that. If you have a smaller budget film, it's a possibility. And even then, you still need ninja style marketing muscle and understanding of your niche audience. Now, the aggregator I used for my first film, This Is Meg, was Distriber. And Distriber, when I was working with them, is a very different company than the company that exists today. A lot of the key players that I worked with has left that company. And it is not the company that I was once promoting. Now, I did promote them fairly heavily the, for, for almost two or three years, I've been promoting them very heavily because they did really good by me. This Is Meg was a success. They helped me get a Hulu deal. They did a whole bunch of things, and I was very, very grateful for it. But I've been hearing recently many stories from filmmakers around the world that use Distriber, and they can't get them on the phone. They can't 
They, they aren't getting paid. Uh, their royalties, their tracking is off. It, it's just, it, there's problems. So the company is going through, a, they're going through some, some, they're going through something. And if I can't get a hold of people, and if I'm having issues with people, someone who's promoted them and sent them a lot of business over the years, if I'm not able to do that, what chance does it just an independent filmmaker with a small movie have? So I'm publicly saying right now, until further notice or until I get some other source of information, I am not recommending any filmmaker use distributor to aggregate their feature film. I repeat, I do not recommend any filmmaker use distributor as an aggregator to get their films out there. Period. I'm all about helping filmmakers. I'm all about just trying to help them survive and thrive in this business. And if I feel that something I've done or promoted in the past is no longer doing that or is even hurting filmmakers, I will come out with a vengeance. And this is coming from a lot of filmmakers who've reached out to me, consulting clients who've reached out to me that are saying, hey, I have a movie. I heard that Distributor's really good because you've told me it was really good. I can't have that anymore. I, and I've, and that I literally have gotten probably about 10 of those messages in the last week. And I just said, I can't, I can't do this. I want to make sure that no filmmaker is hurt with this process. And now that I've discovered that they're going through a lot of changes and a lot of the people that were there are now gone, no way. So once again, I do not recommend any filmmaker use Distributor as a aggregator to put their films out into the SVOD, TVOD world. And now I know a lot of you have been asking me, what, where do I go, Alex? What other aggregators do I use? I will let you know because I will do some research and find some other people that I can recommend. Hopefully somebody out there is going to be a good fit for not only the Indie Film Hustle tribe, but for anybody who listens to my voice and lets them know that these guys I feel are good and they're going to take good care of you. So I'll let you know when I find an option. Now, another option, guys, I want to tell you is I've, and I've had her on the podcast many, many times. If you have a movie of a certain budget range, Indie Rights is by far one of the best deals in town for a traditional distribution company. And they're really not even a traditional distribution company. They're so they're so wonderful and outside the box. They kind of they kind of um don't fit the model of a distributor. So Linda Nelson's been on the show many times and I'll put links on on the uh, epi- on the show notes for uh, her episode so you can listen to them. And they have a wonderful deal and I have gone with them to release my film on the corner of ego and desire. And I have, if I'm going with them for my feature film, that probably says a lot. So I would recommend you reach out to them as a possible distribution partner in your, in your films. And if you listen to her episodes, you can hear all the details about how great their deal is, how transparent they are with their filmmakers. They allow all the filmmakers to talk to each other. Everyone sees you know, results and reports. It, there's a lot of transparency inside Indie Rights, and I would recommend them highly and check out what they have to offer. And again, I'll put all that information in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 343. Now, a lot of you are asking, I'm sure in your head, Alex, is there any hope for us? Is there any hope for filmmakers outside of going down this traditional model? Yes. That is why I am writing my new book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. It is a book that shows you a blueprint on how to think outside the box when it comes to your film. It shows you how to create multiple revenue streams outside of just distribution of your movie. There is multiple ways you can make money with your movies. And some, in some cases that I put in the book, they make tons more money off of things that are outside the movie. 
that they actually give the movie away to generate sales for their other product lines. There is hope, guys. And that's why I opened up filmtrepreneur.com, the podcast, and why I'm writing this book. And hopefully the book will be out sometime in October, if not early November. And trust me, this book is going to be fairly epic. It is, I really go deep and I kind of uncover a lot of myths and BS that I've seen, heard about, or experienced within this business. And I, it is, uh, it's a must read for anybody listening to me and anyone making a movie or anyone trying to get their movie out there. You should definitely read this. If you're thinking about making a movie, I would also think about reading this as well. And th that's another thing, guys. So many filmmakers are like, I just finished my movie. Okay, now I got to figure out distribution. No, no. You need to figure out distribution when you're in pre-production of your movie. Start thinking about all of that way, way, way before. There's no other business in the world that you will spend literally hundreds, if not millions of dollars on a product and then think about how you're going to sell it after it's done. Nobody does that. That's not good business sense, guys. So think about your distribution. Think about other revenue streams that you can create off of your film. And again, I'll go into all of that in the book. And if you want to pre-order the book, just head over to filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. And you can pre-order it there. It already hit the number one on the bestseller list on Amazon for filmmaking books. So obviously there is a need for this. And I really hope that this book provides you an immense amount of service and helps you on your filmmaking path. I hope this episode helped you out a lot. You know, I just am just tired of hearing these stories and these horror stories of filmmakers just taking, getting abused and abused and abused by by, by distributors, by these predatory distributors. And that's exactly what they are. They are predatory distributors. I mean, I can't even tell you. I wish I could tell you my stories and my horror stories of distributors I worked with years and years ago before I even opened up Indie Film Hustle. And I could tell you horror stories then. It's just, it's, it's fairly disgusting. And I really do hope that this episode has helped even just one filmmaker not make that mistake. Because when you make that mistake, guys, and you make a bad distribution deal, what are your chances of making another movie? And that's where the heartbreak happens. That's what this business feeds on. It feeds, it, this business cannot run without the fresh blood that these leeches can suck off of every month. So now everybody's making movies, everyone's coming in, there's new product, there's a gluttony of product in the marketplace. So they have their pick of the litter. They can do whatever they want, they can be as abusive as they want because they have all the power, or so they think. There is another way, there is hope, and hopefully this episode has helped you move into that direction. And if you haven't already, please go check out my new website, filmtrepreneur.com, or you can use filmmakingbusiness.com. It'll get you there faster if you can't spell filmtrepreneur. And check out the podcast. Check out all the content that I'm putting up there weekly. It's a real good resource for filmmakers uh, trying to figure out another way to make money with their film. Actually turn your movies into a business and not solely just depend on film distributors for the income and the revenue streams from your movie. There are other options. So thanks again for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. Great news from Sprint. The wait is finally over. The new Samsung Galaxy Note 10 with the powerful S Pen has arrived at Sprint, and you can get it for 50% off with a Sprint Flex lease. That's right. Get the power of performance and productivity of the Galaxy Note 10 for less than $20 per month. There's never been a better time to switch. To learn more, visit your local Sprint store, sprint.com slash Galaxy Note 10, or call 800-SPRINT-1 today. 1979 a month after 1980 monthly credit applied with two bills with approved credit 18-month lease and new line of service. If canceled, early remain balance due. Excuse tax coverage and offer not available everywhere. Third day activation fee restrictions apply. 
Welcome to Sherwin-Williams. Hi there. I heard paints are 30% off. Yep, and stains too. Right here. Mm-hmm. Only at your neighborhood Sherwin-Williams store. Right now? Well, August 29th through September 9th. Ah, bring it in. I'm a big hugger. It's cool. Ask Sherwin-Williams August 29th through September 9th and save 30% on paints and stains with sale prices starting at $26.94. Only at your local Sherwin-Williams store. Retail sales only. Some exclusions apply. See store for details.